Hi teachers, it's Andrea Haas from Elm Tree Education and I'm back with another LitBit segment where I answer teacher submitted questions on literacy instruction in just a little bit. Um, if you have uh, been here the last couple weeks, you know that we're actually in the middle of a three-part series because I had too much to say that really couldn't be done in just a little bit. And so I have uh, chunked this up over uh, the last three weeks. So if you haven't seen part one and part two, I encourage you to go uh, catch those um, to see uh, some of the misconceptions about the science of reading, uh, misconceptions one through four. Um, and today I'm going to just do a quick re recap of those and then head right into five and then some practical ideas um, for what you can do in this time. So we started with misconception one, which was people sometimes don't even really understand what the science of reading actually is <laughs> and that it's really a body of research, not curriculum or methodologies or phonics or all those things. Uh, then um, also if you've got an older student especially that is struggling, it doesn't mean that they necessarily need foundational skills. And we also, while we are focusing on foundational skills in a little more intentional systematic way, we don't want to do that at the expense of other things um, and things should always be should be some integration there uh, then there are words that right now some folk cannot say they have become um, bad words <laughs> in the teaching realm um, and that is not necessarily true not all things are bad there were some good things that happened from these practices. Um, and if you want to know more about that, please go watch uh, video number two. Okay. And then uh, last time I ended with the fact that really we can never have a one size fits all approach to literacy because we deal with humans and the humans in front of us are going to all be different with different needs and, um, you know, some are cactuses and some are roses and we don't necessarily give the same amount of water and sunlight to cactuses as we do roses and fertilizer and all those kinds of things like they're going to need different things to grow which is exactly true with our kids they're going to need different things to grow sometimes 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 there's some trends and some things that we can lean on but um very rarely i would i can't even think of a time that I've ever seen a piece of curricula be what everybody needed in the room. So that brings us to my very last myth, misconception about the science of reading. And this one's a little bit tricky. Um, so the misconception is that anything that is stamped science of reading, or even that it's stamped evidence-based on it guarantees that there's some sort of alignment with the research and that they are for sure promising successful student outcomes. Okay. Here's where your critical thinking and reading uh, needs to come into play. I'm just going to warn you that you should be very cautious. You should be a critical consumer of any post on social media any article that you read online, uh, curriculum materials, intervention materials, etc., that say, especially they say evidence-based, because I just heard Marianne Wolf the other day, she's the author of Reader Come Home, and she said, evidence-based doesn't mean anything anymore. <laughs> it's just like saying something is new and improved. Like, it's, it's just like become like, like just jargon that is empty. There's nothing, there's nothing behind it. Um, it's kind of like how in diet culture, um, they'll try to sell you that their diet because, oh, I know you've tried this and you've tried this and you've tried this and you tried this before. Well, the reason why it didn't work was because you weren't doing our method. La, 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 la. Here it is. Here's the results. And then like in the fine print, it'll say like, you know, like here's somebody who lost like 60 pounds in three months. Or whatever <laughs> and then it'll say in the fine print like actual results may vary you know this is exactly what's happening with curriculum is that like they're like the diet culture like buy our curriculum because we can promise evidence-based results that your kids are gonna all grow as readers and they can't possibly promise that 
again, like I said last time, they don't know who are the kids in front of you. Actually, they make really pretty big assumptions about who the kids are in front of you, and rarely is that the case. Uh, so again, if you want to hear more about that, go back to video, um, the second video of this series. Um, also, like, there's a lot of stakeholders out here, and they all have different agendas. So I also just kind of want you to think about when you're hearing something as being science of reading um, or evidence-based, I want you to think about who is this coming from? What are their motivations behind it? Are they trying to make you some money? Because they're trying to sell you something? Um, how long have these folks um, been doing the work? Uh, is this some curricula that they just like cranked out really fast in response to everything that's happening in the world of education right now and they can't possibly have had time to really thoroughly test it. Um, there's just all sorts of stuff. So what I want to say, say here is the problem is not the research. The problem is not science of reading. It's the problem is not this movement, right? It's just that the versions of the science of reading that are being implemented in the curriculum, like some of them like maybe like are inspired by the research um, or they have like some of it is and then some of it isn't. Um, they're also throwing about everything they can in the kitchen sink in some of these um, products because they're trying to meet the needs of everybody. And it just becomes um, too much that teachers then are like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to prioritize and they're too overwhelmed. Okay. I'll also say, without trying to throw some specific um, curriculum under the bus, that <sighs> remember what I said earlier, again, if you didn't watch the last two videos, go back and watch those. Um, everything needs to be done in alignment and in integration. Things should not be siloed. Okay, they, every researcher that I have been looking at, um, all their stuff that they've been reporting on, that stuff that they're quoting, everything that I have been pulling, and I have been doing a lot of this, by the way. <laughs> I've been looking at so much stuff, so many books and resources. Um, they all say that things should not be siloed, that things should be done together that we shouldn't have a separate time for reading and writing, that we shouldn't have a separate time for word study and writing and reading. Like, because it all goes together, decoding and encoding go right together. Encoding means like the spelling or the writing of the words. Um, so like, if you are being sold something or your district has adopted something that is only covering one piece and they're doing it in isolation, um, be a little suspicious. There's one, again, there's one particular um, really popular um, curriculum for phonemic awareness um, that is out there and that people are using. And uh, they actually don't have it tied to science because if they did, then they would make sure that they actually did show print and not say that you can do phonemic awareness like in a dark closet. You don't have to see print at all. Um, because again, if we're, if the whole goal is reading, all of our work should be an advancement of that. And so like we can't just do phonemic awareness outside of the letters and the phonics. So, so like it's got to be connected. Um, yes, you need those skills. Yes, they're important, but um, yeah. They are, I think, revising a little bit about their work, but their stuff's out there pretty widespread right now. So that's all I'm saying. Okay. Uh, this quote is from uh, the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Knowledge Matters campaign. They are 14 researchers, again, interdisciplinary, um, that have a vested interest in the fact that, uh, again, a lot of the curriculum are not integrating things. Um, we're losing content knowledge at the expense of prioritizing reading and math. Um, so we're losing social studies and science knowledge, which we know is important. 
if our whole goal of education is to make sure that we have productive members of our society leaving our walls, you know, leaving our doors, I guess, our buildings, after they graduate, they're going to need to know how the world works. They're going to need to have um, a sense of civic responsibility, of understanding history and the implications and um, knowing, um, you know, being able to, when faced with a research study, being able to see where it's kind of weak because they didn't follow the method, you know, all those kinds of things. So I'll go ahead and read this out loud just because I just thought this quote was really powerful and um, kind of part, it's part of their mission, the, the Knowledge Matters campaign. Now, the advisory committee is not necessarily like endorsing whatever else the Knowledge Matters campaign is putting out there, but this was a statement that they did make and they did put it um, on the ASCD uh, CD website. The scientific research on reading and writing is clear. Foundational skills, including phonemic awareness, knowledge of sound letter relationships, decoding and spelling skills, and fluency are necessary, but not sufficient for students to become fully literate. Systematically building knowledge is also vital, so students can understand and apply what they learn from the words on the page and can write in a way that shares their knowledge with others. See, it's pretty clear. I just feel like these words are making me think back to the days of thematic units. Um, and not only was that probably a time saver because you could be spending your whole day working on some, some kind of a big umbrella topic, um, but the kids could see the connections and the value and the relevancy to it. So uh, again, I know you have mandates. I know you have district um, curriculum that's been purchased that you must use with fidelity, um, but maybe there are ways that you can think about trying to integrate these because uh, as I showed the active view of reading, like that content knowledge and, and again, all the research that I'm reading is, is important. So something to think about. Okay, right now in this country, we are kind of in a bit of culture war about everything. <laughs> Um, you know, what's playing out with these reading wars is playing out with a lot of other things in our world. And it's really easy to get, feel dismayed. It's really easy to feel like you are a victim of politics and trying to sift through things as a teacher. Also, like you don't have the time and sometimes you don't even have the access because it's, there's behind a paywall or you have to be like part of the university system to get to some of these research studies. I know that. So what I'm trying to do is support you by making sure that when I go look for answers to your questions, if I don't already know them, um, or if I do know them, I'm double checking to make sure what I'm saying is backed up by research. Like I'm really being very careful. And if ever I get it wrong, I would please hope that somebody would call me out on it um, because I, I don't want to be disseminating anything that would be not accurate. <laughs> so the other bit is I think that it's really easy to get feeling like this, just such a silly fight all the time. And, you know, we're always arguing, but actually like, I think that a lot of researchers are actually more closely aligned than we think. Um, it's a little bit of the rhetoric that's to blame there. Um, we're all just worried about kids reading. We all just want to make sure that they're reading. And so many of us are worried about those from low um, socioeconomic status and um, minority groups, like because we've seen the data and it's not great. Um, it's really one of our biggest social justice issues for education, hands down. Um, so I think we do have a lot more common ground than you might be led to believe. Okay, I've already gone on long enough. Let's wrap this up with things I want you to keep in mind. So based on everything that I've said about all these myths, um, the five myths that I've covered, uh, I, again, I'm gonna hammer home that the researchers agree that nothing should happen in isolation and you shouldn't put one thing ahead at the expense of something else and that you do need all of these things, 
right? It might just be what do you what does this one kid need at the right time, right? In the emphasis. So and that is the hard part <laughs> of of teaching, as we can agree. I don't want you to fall victim to the basal bloat, which is what I was saying earlier when a particular um, uh, publisher has just thrown in everything under the sun that it could possibly think that a teacher might want to make the curriculum look more appealing to the school district who is investing millions and millions of dollars in purchasing this curriculum. And it becomes so overwhelming and you can't possibly do it all. In fact, I also uh, was just reading a piece that um, Nell Duke, uh, she was a guest on a podcast and she had said at that time that her and some colleagues were doing like a thought experiment about a first, first grade classroom and they were thinking, okay, well, if we take all the recommendations about when kids need movement, like in recess and what they should be getting for reading and what they should be getting for math and science and social studies and social emotional learning, learning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we think about all of those things that, that, the research would advise is what is needed um, in terms of time, uh, like time blocks for the instruction. Uh, she said that even if you went with like the, the most conservative minimum of those numbers, the school day is still three hours short. I mean, I think we know that. We're always up against time. We never have enough time to get it all in. <laughs> and so... I think that when you have a curriculum that is overwhelming you because there's too much there, you can't do it all. And you're going to have to make some decisions about what your kids, the kids in front of you actually need. And you have to let go of the rest. Or maybe some kids get some of it and other kids don't. And that's, again, going to be meeting the kids and being responsive to your learners in the room. Okay. I'm going to kind of pick up the pace a little bit because I'm getting on my soapbox again. Um, so yeah, you need to balance the standards with what the kids individual needs. And I don't want you to lose the art of teaching in the science of teaching, because I think that's also what's happening here is that teachers are losing some autonomy. Teachers are losing some professional judgment. Teachers, um, some of the things that um, are coming out are really this effort to try to make things teacher proof by having um, scripted curriculum. But again, we're not teaching robots. We're teaching humans <laughs> and we're human and we got to bring ourselves and that, and we also know how powerful the relationships are. So you've got to bring yourself into the, into the work and you have to be, um, creating a space of joy for you and your students. There's also a lot of research about that too, but I won't get into that. Um, the other thing is, is I've noticed that some folks have, it's like they've forgotten what just good generic instructional practices are. I'm seeing a lot of teacher talk and not as much uh, gradual release as, as I would like in my neck of the woods. Again, that might not be everywhere, but just something that I'm kind of noticing. How can you say less so the kids can be doing more? Because we know that the one who's doing the talking is doing the learning. <laughs> the one who's doing the thinking is doing the learning. You already got it. You don't need to, they need to. And student agency, we cannot have them lose their voice and choice in what they're doing. Or again, that whole idea of engagement and motivation out the window. Um, and then finally, wherever you are with teaching reading, if you're a brand new teacher of the profession, if you're a veteran of 20 years like me, if you have been teaching even longer than that or somewhere in between, I just want you to remember that we're all doing the best we can in our context and with what we know. And if we don't know what we don't know, that's not necessarily our fault. Uh, our system has in some ways let us down. And I would like to be the person who you could come to for research-based, even though I just said you can't always believe research base. Uh, but I really am. I'm doing the research. I'm reading the books. I'm, I'm going to the places. I'm hearing people who normally maybe I would have necessarily always agreed with in the past about teaching. And now I'm opening up to what they have to say. You know, I'm trying to do the work so that you uh, will feel supported by me and you will know that uh, 
I've tried my best to make sure that I'm giving you the most accurate information that is available at this time with what we know. Okay. So, ugh, I keep looking at the clock every time I get done with these and thinking, man, they're getting longer and longer. <laughs> Can you even more verbose? So I'm sorry. Uh, next week, I think I'll, I'll be able to scale it back with the topic. So, uh, so uh, it'll be a little bit lighter, but this has been a good series. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. Um, I still continue to encourage you to ask more questions, submit them um, on the form. Uh, also, if this has sparked some other questions or, or um, you'd like to know where did I get this information from, you know, what are the sources that I have found or I've been using, please reach out to me. I would be happy uh, to provide any of that to you from what I've found. And again, if I've got it wrong, I would love to hear alternate viewpoints because that's the only way we can grow is we kind of come together with all of our viewpoints and the science is always evolving and we should too in our practice. Okay. Take care, everyone. I'll see you next time.